Please turn to Genesis chapter 35. We're going to begin where we left off on the last chapter. In the last chapter, Simeon and Levi had just killed all the people, all the males around them. And Jacob was afraid that the people around were going to retaliate for the sake of all those and all the Shechemites, all those, all the men of Shechem that were killed. And this chapter begins right after that. And we're going to look at this chapter in three parts. We're looking at the whole chapter. It's a long chapter. I'm, I'm dividing it into three parts. The first one is going to be the journey back to Bethel. The next one is going to be God meets with Jacob. And then the third one is going to be death. It's going to cover the issue of death, Reuben's sin, and, and the closing of the generations of Isaac. So let's... Look at the first eight verses right now. Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 through 8. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I'll make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alone Bakuth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege, the privilege of all privileges, to have your word here with us, that we can read it, we can know your word, we can hear from you. And Lord, you've given us your Holy Spirit to be able to understand it. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for your spirit. Please be with us this morning. Please work in our hearts and Father, please, please touch those who don't know you. Save them, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So not much time has passed from this chapter and the previous one. This chapter begins with the word then. So we left off with the last chapter where Jacob was there afraid that the people around them were going to retaliate and, and kill him and kill all of, his, all of his family, all those who were with them. And then this chapter begins saying, then God spoke to him. God spoke to Jacob and God told him to do something that he never told any of the other patriarchs to do. Abraham had built altars. Isaac had built altars. And Jacob had also built altars before this. In fact, there was an altar there in Shechem before God spoke to him and told him to go to Bethel. But this is the first time that God actually spoke to one of the patriarchs and told him to what, what God said here. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God. To God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. God told Jacob to go to Bethel. Well, the last time Jacob was at Bethel, Jacob had made a vow to God that he would come back there and, and worship God there. And it seems like Jacob wasn't too quick to fulfill that vow. He had come back from Paden Aram. He was there at Canaan. What was the first thing he did? He went to Succoth for some time. Then he went to Shechem for some time. And he, he made homes there. So it probably was a number of years that Jacob was still in Canaan, but he had, never, he had not got back to Bethel. So God comes to him and tells him it's time for him to go and worship God there in Bethel. We, we begin with God telling Jacob, arise, go to Bethel, dwell there. And when, what's the first thing that God tells Jacob to do once he gets to Bethel? 
make an altar. Make an altar. Making an altar must come first. If you're moving to a new place, a new town, the first thing you do is you look for the place where you're to worship your God. That's why it's got to be first. We don't make altars in the sense that they did back then, places where they would sacrifice to God. Of course, Jesus is the final sacrifice. He died for our sin. But we make an altar in a sense to where we need to have a place where we worship God. And that altar is going to be church. It's where we gather together to worship God. That's got to be first. And, and if, if the benefits you get from church is fellowshipping with the saints, that's just an added bonus. If the benefits you get from church is having a, a, a local family of God, a spiritual family who cares for you and loves you, one that you can share your prayers, your prayer needs with, and, and who can encourage you and you can encourage them, that's an added bonus. We come to the house of God to worship God. That's got to be first. Everywhere you go, you need to have a place where you have your altar to God, where you worship God. So God told him, go to Bethel, make an altar there. And we see Jacob's response here in verse 2. In verse 2, Jacob said to his household and to all who are with them, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So Jacob repented. He got right with the Lord. And then he called his family. His first thing that he did was he turned to his family. And he told them that they also needed to repent and get right with the Lord. Well, the thing about his family is they're not little anymore. His Two of his sons had just killed a bunch of men. He's not telling a bunch of little kids to do what their father says. He's telling young adults in his home to get rid of their idols, to purify themselves, <clears throat> to change their garments. He said, change your garments. And, you know, we can look at that and we can wonder what that means because there really isn't much more that's told us in, in the text about what that means. I don't know if that's some religious tradition that they had. They had to change their garments to worship God. We're not told that, but at face value, what we see there is whatever they were wearing was inappropriate for their new life in Bethel. They needed to take off what they were wearing, wearing and put something new on. And I can think of the, in the New Testament, we, we, we read about women are to adorn themselves with modest apparel. And of course, men are too as well. But we know that there is a way that we dress that is not proper for worshiping God. A way that we dress that is not proper for people who, who, who know God. We can even say when we come before God in worship, we, what, what we wear matters. This notion that people say, well, my spiritual life uh, should not affect how I dress or how I can dress however I want to and be a, be a Christian. How I dress should not affect my spiritual life. That is wrong. Uh, we, we see here, we don't know exactly what they were wearing that was wrong, but we know that they had to change their garments in order to come before God and worship God. The idolatry was obvious. That was in their home. They had to purify themselves and change their garments. Uh, what, what Jacob is calling here for of his family was a complete repentance. The obvious that was seen and also the, the underlying hidden areas of, of their lives, it all needed to be repented of. Jacob was fearful. It could have been why he was dilly-dallying in Shechem and in Succoth, because he was concerned that going to Bethel meant that there needed to be a, a change in the way that they were living. And also another thing was that Jacob had to admit that he knew about the idols. There was idolatry in his household, and he had to admit that it was there. We know that Rachel, when they left Paid and Aram, she stole her, her father's idols. But now it had spread. It had spread to the rest of the household. Now his whole family has this idolatry. Also in the previous chapter, when Simeon and Levi had killed all those in Shechem, they plundered the household so they could have grabbed more idols there. But Jacob had to acknowledge that <clears throat> he knew about the idols that were there in the household and he did nothing about them. He faced a problem. He faced a problem that all Christian parents face, that all believing families face, and this is it. How can, I, how can I address my children about their sin when I, have proper, when I have failed to properly deal with my own sin in the past? Or even recently, 
How can I address my family about sin that I've allowed to be there for so long? Will they listen to me? Will I come off as a hypocrite? And those thoughts tempt believing parents to just put off dealing with sin in their household. They think that it's too difficult of a situation to deal with. They put up with it for too long. So now it's too late for them to even try to address it. Parents dealing with their children's sin or even a husband with his wife's sin or a wife with her husband's sin. But we see here that Jacob wasn't being a hypocrite and talking to his family about their sin, even though he had allowed it to be there for so long. We, we can look at what happened here. What, what, what happened? The word of God came to Jacob and dealt with him about an area in his life that he was allowing to go on, a, a, a sinful pattern in his household. The word of God came to Jacob. He got right with the Lord. He repented of it. Then he went to his family to deal with it. Of course, it could have, they could have disobeyed their father, but the Lord dealt with his family as well. And what did they do? They handed over the idols. You know, sometimes we can overthink these things and we can look at our situation that we're dealing with and we can think something is too hard for us to deal with even in our homes, even in, in something so close, so intimate as, as our home life, and we don't want to deal with it. But that's where we need to trust in the Word. Most of all, trust in the God of the Word. And as we look at what God, what God did here was God impressed upon Jacob what he needed to do. He told his family what they needed to do after he got right with the Lord. And there they go to Bethel, following the Lord, obedient to the Lord. Yes, it doesn't always work this way, but we need to trust God. And we need to acknowledge in this situation, it worked. In this situation, God helped Jacob to do what was right. Look at the response of Jacob's family there in verse 4. They gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. Do you remember what these idols were called when Rachel stole them from her father back in Pate and Aram right before they left? Right here, right here Jacob calls them foreign gods. What were they called in Pate and Aram? Household idols. Household idols. This is a more fitting for them, though. A more fitting name for them. Foreign gods. You think about a household, a household idol, you look at it, you think, well, that's not so scary. Little statue, little trinkets. How could people worship those things? And you think, well, well that, that's, that's not a fearful thing. But when they're called foreign gods, it really tells us the threat that they are. They are a threat. They're, they may not be scary to those who don't worship them, but to those who, who are bound by them, to those who worship them, that's where the threat is. That's what these are. They're foreign gods because they threaten to take the place in a person's heart that only God should, should have. Amen. So they're a huge threat. They're dangerous. They're deadly. They're damning these household idols, what was it that Laban called them when, when Laban overtook Jacob? What, what did he tell Jacob? He didn't say, but why did you take my household idols? He said, why did you take my gods? We can look at that and think, well, that's a funny thing. These gods must not be so great if they can get stolen from Laban and he doesn't know where they're at. We can think, well, that's, that's a funny thing, but that wasn't funny for Laban. He was bound by these gods. He was bound by these idols. So Jacob told his family to get rid of these foreign gods. And what did they do? They buried them in Shechem before they even went to Bethel. So here's a good pattern for us. Christian, don't take your idols with you. Don't carry them around with you. Get rid of them. Bury them. Remove them before you go to your God and worship. There needs to be a time where you cut off these idols from your life. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And your idols are whatever you put in your heart where only God should be. Whatever takes hold of your heart, of your thoughts, of your emotions, whatever you spend your money on, whatever you spend your time on. 
Well, let's keep reading here and starting in verse 9. We'll read verse 9 through 15. Then Jacob appeared to him again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and to your des descendants after you, I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. So this appearance here of God is similar to the, the last time when God wrestled with Jacob that night, that last time when God wrestled with Jacob in Peniel. It's similar to that time, but it's not the same time. Because the last time was in, Pen was in Peniel. But this time is here in, in Bethel. And then also it says there in verse 9, Then God appeared to Jacob again. Again, this is another appearance of God. How many times did God appear to Jacob? Or how many times did God meet with Jacob? What do you think? How many times do you remember God meeting with Jacob? Well, that first time was in Bethel. <clears throat> and then God went to Paden, and then Jacob went to Paden Aram. And Jacob speaks to his, his wives, Rachel and Leah, and tells them that God had spoke to him in a dream. And then when they leave from Paden Aram and, and um, God speaks to him again in Peniel, or meets with them and wrestles with them in Peniel, uh, Jacob meets with, or angels meet with Jacob in Mahanaim. God spoke to Jacob at the beginning of this chapter. That would have been sometime before he got to Bethel. And then here God meets with him again while he's in Bethel. So repeatedly Jacob is having these encounters with God and even with, with angels. And we can almost think, well, when am I going to have some experience like this? Is God going to meet with me like God met with Jacob? Well, God doesn't meet with another one of his people until hundreds of years after this when God meets with, with, uh, with Moses in the burning bush. So this is the last time that we see that God met with Jacob. And the last time that God meets with any of his people for hundreds of years. And here when God meets with Jacob, <clears throat> he tells him that your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. God already told him this at Peniel. This isn't something new for Jacob to hear. Jacob already heard this from God. What God is doing here is God is reminding Jacob of his new name. He's reminding Jacob of his, of his new name and his new identity. With a new name comes a new identity. Jacob, you're not the same Jacob that you used to be. You're not the same supplanter. You're not the same heel grabber that you used to be. You're now prince with God. You're now a new person with a, with a new identity. And it's the same thing for us as God's people. Christian, you're not the same old, old sinner that you used to be. Amen. You're the... <clears throat> Excuse me, you're, you're, you're a saint now with God. We think we can think, how many times do we need to be reminded of that? How many times do we need to be reminded? I'm not the same old sinner I used to be. I'm now a, a saint with God. Well, as many times as we forget. Yeah. If we forget that, we need to be reminded of that. And here, Jacob had a meeting with God, and God reminded him of this. And then it says there that, God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. God went up from him. So this wasn't just an, app an apparition that Jacob had. He wasn't just hearing the voice of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. If God went up from him, that means God had to come down to meet with him. This was a person of God coming and meeting with Jacob. It's an amazing thing. God came down to meet with Jacob, and then God went up from meeting with him. So let's continue reading the rest of the chapter. Starting in verse 16. Excuse me. <clears throat> verse 16, we'll read the rest of the chapter. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, 
Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, <clears throat> Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel went, when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Ju and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. <clears throat> the sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, <clears throat> Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in, in Padan Aram. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kir Kirjosh Arba, that is Hebron, where Abram, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. <clears throat> So even though this chapter covers a spiritually healthy time in Jacob's life, it is also full of death. Death and a grievous act of sin, his oldest son's sin, his Reuben's sin. So we have three deaths here. The first one is there in verse 8. <clears throat> verse 8 says, Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Elon Bakuth. De this is Deborah, this is Rebecca's nurse. It's interesting that nowhere in the book of Genesis or nowhere in the scriptures do we see about Rebecca's death, but we see her nurse's death mentioned here. And this wasn't just some random person in, in Jacob's tribe. Somehow, Deborah had become a part of Jacob's, Jacob's tribe, of Jacob's group of people. She was Rebecca's nurse, his mother's nurse, so she would have nursed Jacob since he was a baby, he had known her all of his life, and she was actually a, a, a dear person in his tribe. She was very loved by, by the people, very loved by Jacob, very loved by all the people there, very appreciated, very respected. We know that because of what they called the place where she was buried, Elon Bakus. It means terebinth of weeping. <clears throat> the second death is there in verses 16 through 18. It says, Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there, was a, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, <clears throat> for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni. But his father called him Benjamin. Rachel's death was, of course, very difficult for her husband to deal with. He had, he had, this was a wife that he loved. This was a wife that he had worked 14 years for. <clears throat> it, it, it was kind of the Lord, though, to take her after they ar had already arrived in Bethel. After the, the family had already surrendered their idols and, and purified themselves, changed their garments, and made that journey over to Bethel. If the Lord had taken her while they were still in Shechem, for example, Jacob could have, struck, could have struggled and wondered, why did the Lord take Rachel so soon? Was it because of sin? Was it because of the sin in our household? But it was kind of the Lord to take her after the family had gotten right with the Lord here. <clears throat> but her death does remind us of, of a truth that we don't always get to live a, a full and long life before God takes us. Not everyone dies after they have lived a long, full life. Some people die early. Some people die quickly, unexpectedly. 
Here Jacob is expecting to have a, a child, <coughs> his 12th son. And not just another son, but a special son, a son of, his, of the wife that he loved. And his wife died. We don't always die when we want to die. I mean, when do we want to die, right? But we don't always die after we've lived a long life. Some of us will die suddenly. I realized that with Nicole's death. Our church realized that with Sam's death recently. <clears throat> but by the time 2024 hits, maybe not every one of us will be here. Maybe by the time 2025 comes. We always need to be ready for that time when the Lord calls us home. We always need to be ready that God may call me home this year. God may call me home this week. And we see that here with, with this second death. The third death is going to be there in verses 28 and 29. It says, <coughs> excuse me. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Isaac's death actually took place about 50 years after this here in this chapter. This isn't really chronological where he died here. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah had the twins Esau and Jacob. Then Esau was 40 years old when he married the Hittites, prompting Isaac to send Jacob away to Paden Aram. Jacob was there for about 20 years and then he came back. So Jacob would have been 60 years old when he got back. He spent some years in, in Succoth and Shechem, but it was no more than five to ten years. So by this time, when this chapter closes, Isaac would have been no more than 130 years old here. And then it says, how old was he when he died? 180 years old. <clears throat> so he fast forwarded, <clears throat> excuse me, about 50 years to include Isaac's death in this chapter. Why? Why is his death included in this chapter, a third death? Well, here's why. Because this chapter is really the end of a section. It's the end of a section in Genesis. You remember that the generations, the, the sections in Genesis, it's also called the Toledots. That's the Hebrew for it. Well, there's these different sections in Genesis. I forget if it's nine or ten sections. In Genesis 5, we see that it begins with the, the Toledot of Adam. In Genesis 6 and verse 9, it begins with the Toledot of Noah. Genesis 11, 27, the Toledot of Terah, who was Abraham's father, and that is mostly about Abraham. In Genesis 25, 19, we have the generations of Isaac, which that focused mostly upon Jacob. The next chapter will deal with uh, the, the generations of Esau. And then chapter 37 is the generations of Jacob, and that will deal mostly with with the life of Joseph, of course, throughout the rest of the book of Genesis. So this what we're dealing with here is really the closing of the generations of Isaac. And that's why his death is put in here, even though it happened like 50 years later. That's also why there is this short genealogy there in verses 22 through 26. That's not random. <clears throat> What's happening here is this generations of Isaac is, is being wrapped up and, and it's making way for the generations of Esau and then the generation, generations of Jacob. And then we have a grievous sin mentioned here. It's in verses 21 and 22. It says there in verse 21, Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. I don't think this was an act of lust. Bilhah was Rachel's maidservant. She would have been old enough to be Reuben's mother. <clears throat> I think this had to do with him trying to get the position. <clears throat> him trying to get a, a position in the family. King Adonijah, or King David's son, his name was Adonijah, did the same thing. When David was about to die, Adonijah had set himself up as king. He got a following around him, and, and they all said that he was king, and he was trying to make himself king, even though David didn't want him to be king. David wanted Solomon to be king, 
So in response to what Adonijah was doing, David went and quickly had Solomon ordained to be king. Well, Solomon had mercy upon Adonijah. He didn't have him killed. And then after David died, Adonijah was still trying to be king. What he did was he requested for Abishag the Shunammite to be his wife. Well, Abishag the Shunammite was one of David's concubines. They weren't intimate together because David was so old when she was his concubine, but she was his concubine. And Adonijah did this in a sneaky way by asking for Abishag through Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Solomon's answer to Bathsheba was, this was his answer. Now, why do you ask Abishag, the Shunammite, for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my older brother. So he was already a threat to take the throne because he was older than Solomon. And then now he was also seeking David's concubine as his wife, which would, add, which would just have increased his ability to take over the throne. And then what did Solomon end up doing to Adonijah there? Do you remember? Well, he had him killed. He had him killed. That was the, the last straw. And this was, this was a similar event with Reuben. Reuben was the oldest, and he was sure to get the birthright, and he probably was just trying to secure the birthright before his father had even died. Of course, this backfired him, backfired on him. <clears throat> the birthright didn't go to him. It went to Joseph instead. We read that in 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 2. <clears throat> Another thing we see here with these deaths is that there is a, a progression that we see here. A progression. The first death, of course, is there in verse 8. Verse 8 simply says that Deborah died and she was buried. Well, this is what all atheists believe. We die, we bury it, and, and that's it. We're, we die and we're, and we're gone after we're buried. All life has to do with is this life here. Nothing else matters other than what we, what we do here. So live it up. There's no judgment to come. There's no eternity. There is no God who we're going to be judged by. That's the first death. Deborah died and was buried. The second death is in verse 18. It says about Rachel that her soul was departing, for she died. So now we know we go somewhere. This isn't the end. The third death is in verse 29. It says about Isaac that he died and was gathered to his people. So we know that this isn't the end of our life. Death is an extremely difficult thing for us to deal with. It's the ending of this life. It's, it's, it's the ending of all the relationships that we have. We understand it's extremely difficult, even for those who know the Lord. It, it is an entire change. You go from this address to another address, and you'll never come back here, and you'll never see those again over there. Or if you do, if they're in glory, you don't, we don't even know each other the same as we know each other now. Our Lord said we'll be like the angels in heaven. So it can be difficult, very difficult. But we know that for those who know God, <clears throat> this isn't the end. This isn't the end of our lives. This isn't the end of our, our loved one's life. They're departing and they're going somewhere. They're going somewhere to be far better than here. They're going to be with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll receive you, that where I am, you may be with me also. They're also going to, to be gathered with the rest of God's people. And, and, and that is where all you know is complete goodness, joy unimaginable, joy unspeakable. We, we can think, well, all, all I know about is just this body, the, the first kind of death. <clears throat> when I die, I'll be buried and that's it. We put too much thoughts upon these bodies that God has given us, even though these bodies are temporary. When we die, our soul goes, leaves these bodies and goes and departs and goes somewhere, either in eternity in hell for those who don't know the Lord or to be with Christ forever for those who do. But, but then we read that God gives us new bodies. So we can wonder, why do we put so much attention, so much time on these bodies, even though these are temporary, when we're going to live forever and ever and ever, especially those who know the Lord, when God's even going to give us new bodies, spiritual bodies, these bodies are going to be replaced. 
It's not that this is the only body we're going to have, brother and sister. It's not that this is the only body that we're going to have and we're just going to be spirits for all eternity. We're actually going to have bodies then Amen. that replace these bodies. Bo and, and, and not to mention bodies that don't get sick anymore, bodies that don't get weak anymore. There's going to be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death. Yes, death is a very difficult thing to deal with. And it, it, it always is. But when I think about the verse that says, Death, where is your sting? For the Christian will be with Christ, will be like Jacob, gathered to his people. And we see that in this chapter. As difficult as death is to deal with, it's not the end. So a few things as we wrap up. A few things that we see here about God. Uh, one thing is, the first thing is that we see that God is faithful. Every time we look at God's people, we're going to see the faithfulness of God. And this is another case. God is faithful. When Jacob went to his family and told them to get rid of the idols, purify themselves, change their garments, they were going to Bethel. Jacob was going to make an altar there. Jacob told them that he was going to make an altar to God. And then he said <clears throat> that God is the one who answered him in the day of his distress. And that God is the one who had been with him ever since. This is his faithful God. When he was in distress and he had nowhere to turn, he had no one to help him, God was the one who answered him. He, God is the one who has been with him ever since. God is faithful to his people. Remember when they were journeying to Bethel and the people didn't attack them? Well, they didn't attack them not because the people didn't notice Jacob and his camp traveling, not because the people saw them and thought, no, I don't want to deal with that with them after all. No, they, they, they wanted to retaliate. They wanted to kill them. They wanted to slaughter them for what they did to the Shechemites. But they didn't. Why didn't they? Because God put what is called the terror of God upon the cities that were all around them. There was this terror upon the people. So when Jacob and his group of people were traveling, they didn't look very scary. Yeah, his son, I mean, they, they weren't wimps, right? His sons killed all, all, all the men while they were all wounded and recovering from surgery. But this wasn't like Jacob's brother traveling with the 400 men. Now, they would have looked very scary. This is Jacob's people traveling. And the terror of God was upon those around them. Again, the faithfulness of God. The protecting care of God upon Jacob. The safest place... For any one of us to be is right where God wants us to be. It doesn't matter where that is. It doesn't need to be out in the country. It doesn't need to be where nobody locks their doors. It doesn't need to, need to be the place with the lowest death rate. The, the safest place for the Christian to be is right where God wants him to be. That's why we have a missionary in Lebanon who's unsure if he should head back to the States. Because he knows that God told him to go to Lebanon but he's not so sure that God told him it's time to leave there because of the danger. And that's the way it is for every single one of us. The safest place for you and me to be is where God wants us to be. And don't move from there until God has told you to, until you're sure that God has led you to. <clears throat> we also see that God also restored Jacob and Esau's relationship. Remember that that Esau had said that he was going to kill Jacob after their father had died out of respect for the father. Once their dad was going to die, he was planning to kill Jacob. Well, their father died, and he no longer wanted to kill Jacob. So God dealt with his heart. Even though he wasn't saved, even though he never repented and turned to the Lord, God still dealt with Esau's heart. And their relationship was restored. Another thing we see of God is that he patiently reminded Jacob to go back to Bethel. Even though he was here taking a sweet old time and, and, and Succoth and Shechem, God came to him and told him again, go to Bethel, make an altar there, and live there. God patiently told him to do what God had already expected him to do because of that vow that Jacob had made. And also God patiently reminded Jacob of his new name, he had already told him that new name, and, and the thing is, he wasn't always living up to that name. 
And God had to come and remind him. God patiently reminded him of that. If we have to remind someone to do something that we already told them to do, we don't like to do that. We think, why do I have to remind so-and-so to do this? I already told him this. I already told her that. Sh shouldn't she have heard, heard me and obeyed me the first time? She doesn't know who I am. I shouldn't have to re remind, remind them. I shouldn't have to say this again. Well, we're that way because we're impatient and because we're not humble and because we're arrogant, because we think we're more than we really are. That's why we are that way. But God is not that way. If anyone should be listened to, if anyone shouldn't have to remind us and shouldn't have to tell us more than once, it's God. But God is patient with his people. There in verse 11, God calls himself, I am God Almighty. God Almighty. And then he tells him about how he needs to go and multiply and, and, and fill the land of Canaan, basically. I am God Almighty. There we see that there is nothing that is too hard for our God. There's nothing that God cannot do. There's nothing that is impossible for God. Jesus said with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. There is nothing that your God cannot do. And when a Christian knows that and believes that and knows that to be true, he's going to live differently than those who don't know that to be true. Christian, there is nothing that your God cannot do. There is nothing that is too hard for your God. You, you can't do much of anything. You're finite. You're weak. You think you can do more than you can. But there is nothing that's too hard for God. He is God Almighty. Well, let's pray.